Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion about supply and demand. But first we want to think about what a price system or a market system is. It's an economic system which relative prices, right, prices of certain things in terms of other things, are constantly changing to reflect changes in supply and demand. Now this is pretty important because it allows prices to act as signals, right? These prices now tell us information about what is relatively scarce or relatively abundant. We also want to think a little bit about this idea of voluntary exchange, right? If there's any sort of trade between two people or groups of people, uh, we want to think that this trade is voluntary. That is, people are making their own decisions for themselves, and this is going to allow us to sort of validate that trade makes uh, both parties better off. Additionally, when we want to think a little bit about transaction costs, right, which is just a fancy way of saying all of the costs that are associated with any form of trade, right? This can be inform information, right? How how long does it take me to find out about the quality, right, of a of of something, right? Uh, how long does it take me to figure out if there's been any uh, problems that this thing has had in the past, um, and so on, right? Uh, it, this kind of allows us to think a little bit about what is the role of middlemen in an economy, right? Uh, these, you know, middlemen oftentimes are brokers of information, right? They reduce transaction costs. Uh, why do I go to a car dealership when I can just phone up Ford or, or, or GM and say, I'd like one of your cars, please? Well, obviously, I don't know all there is to know about cars, so I go to a dealership. They, they have already collected the information for me it reduces transaction costs. But sort of think about those while we're thinking about changing supply and demand, right, to create sort of this uh, disequilibrium, right, this point where we're not at an equilibrium. Um, so here's what we're going to think about, where we have some sort of demand shift, right? Something has happened where demand has increased, right? That is, the curve, the, this D1, has increased outward or to the right to D2. And you can kind of see what would happen where you'd move from equilibrium 1 to equilibrium 2 and so on. Similarly, we have a, an example of a decrease in demand. Right, We are at D1. We move in or to the left to this D3. Our equilibrium goes from E1 to E3. We can also do the same sort of thing with supply, right? where we have S1, right, supply, this upward sloping curve, and that's going to be moving down and to the right, or to the right, to S2, and our equilibrium goes from E1 to E2. We can also think similarly about a decrease in supply. And while we're looking at these graphs, you may notice something, right? We've got this uh, sort of intuitively pleasing result that when demand increases, the equilibrium price and quantity also increase, and vice versa for, for a decrease, right? Now we also have with supply, an increase in supply will decrease equilibrium price, but increase equilibrium quantity. See about looking back at those graphs and see if you can sort of look at it and maybe think about why a little bit more. Sometimes it's interesting to think about what happens when both supply and demand change, right? So suppose you have both changing in, in some direction. What's the outcome? Well, it's, it's a little difficult to say, right? It depends on how much each curve is shifting, and do the curves sort of change at all? For that, you'd need a little bit of a, uh, a background in analysis and to sort of think about uh, an equation for demand to kind of approximate just how much the equilibrium price or quantity may change. Now there are certain cases where you can sort of know something is going to happen. For example, when both demand and supply increase, right, both are increasing, then the equilibrium quantity is definitely going to go up, but the price we're not sure. And likewise, when both demand and supply decrease, the equilibrium quantity decreases. When supply decreases and demand increases, the price is definitely going to go up. 
but we're not necessarily sure what's going to happen with the quantity. We need, we need a little bit more information. And similarly, when supply increases and demand decreases. Now, when there's a change in supply and demand, how fast do prices go from that E1 to E2 point? How quickly do prices reach the equilibrium value? Well, it sort of depends on the flexibility of the price or stickiness of the price. In some markets, prices may respond pretty quickly. In others, it may take the form of a subtle adjustment, right? And it may not reach equilibrium so fast. Uh, certain markets, you know, have different characteristics that affect the adjustment seed. And in, in other markets, you may jump over the equilibrium price entirely, and then maybe jump back down and sort of have this ping pong effect until the prices are reached in equilibrium. An interesting thing about prices is they sort of allow us to, oh, sorry, they sort of allow us to think about how decisions are synchronized, right? Uh, so prices sort of allow this simultaneous decision making to happen among buyers and sellers. Now there are a couple of ways that we can sort of see non-price rationing happen, right? Perhaps we just have a line and it's first come first serve until uh, the thing that we're selling ends. Or maybe we just have a group of people and we pick, you know, randomly choose who gets what. Uh, these are all, pri you know, different ways of rationing um, that are, are without using prices. Now recall what we were thinking about with scarcity. Rationing sort of is brought on by scarcity. Think about it. Suppose we're selling five apples and there's this group of people, perhaps they're waiting in line. There's more than five people in the line, we have to figure out who gets what, right? Prices sort of allow us to do that in the most efficient way. We can maybe create an auction to decide who gets what out of the, you know, long line of people. Whoever's willing to pay the most for the apples can get the apples. It's maybe a lot better than randomly selecting who gets the apples. Another important and honestly fascinating part of uh, supply and demand is to think about price ceilings, right? Uh, but first we want to just say what is a price control in general? So a price control is a government mandated minimum or maximum price. You could have a price ceiling, which is a legal maximum price, or a price floor, which is a legal minimum price, right? Ceiling, it can't go any higher. Floor, it can't go any lower. It must be at least that price, if it's a price floor, for price ceiling, it can't be greater than that price. So price ceilings and floors, they may prevent the equilibrium price from actually being reached. Right? So think about an equilibrium price that's above the price ceiling. Right? Well, the price ceiling says it can't be above that price. So you kind of have a price that is hitting the ceiling and gets caught there. It can't reach equilibrium. Sometimes this can create, right, a black market, an underground market. It's going to create a shortage, right? So we may reach a black market, a market in which price-controlled goods are sold at an illegally high price, right? Why are they illegal? Well, because we have this government-mandated maximum price. But you could argue, and, and perhaps correctly, that a black market is just trying to have the price reach an equilibrium value. It's meeting demand. Sort of in conjunction with a price floor, we can think of a support price, right? So the government will choose a price floor for some product and then acts to ensure that the price of the product will never fall below some support level. Right? Price floors are associated with many agricultural products and a price floor that's set above the market clearing price, right, the equilibrium price, it's going to result in a surplus. So here we kind of have a nice example that you might want to think about where we're talking about uh, pounds of milk, right? And we have some, uh, some floor at, uh, you know, it looks like 10 cents, right? And so we have sort of this upper portion where we have a surplus, right? At 15, where we have 15 demanded and 16 supplied. 
the other sort of uh, archetypal case of uh, price floor is a minimum wage, right? So it's the lowest amount that you can uh, pay an employee per hour, for example. Right, so here's kind of a graph that's sort of explaining it. So we have WE is our equilibrium wage, QE down here is our equilibrium quantity. Well, suppose that we have a minimum wage, WM, right? Well, now at this higher wage, there are QD demanded by firms and QS supplied by laborers. So there's this sort of distance between that's our um, surplus of labor or our unemployment. Another thing that can sort of lead us to a disequilibrium is sort of quantity restrictions, right? So governments can impose quantity restrictions, right? They don't particularly like it if you uh, trade organs or drugs or hospital beds. So, you know, these are kind of uh, restrictions, right, on quantity that can be traded. Now, there can be just prohibitions, right? You can think of prohibition of alcohol or prohibition of marijuana. Uh, where government doesn't like quantities to be traded. Uh, they may impose licensing requirements that quantities can't be purchased, you know, until you have a license. Maybe think of a gun. Um, you could have import quotas, for example. So you can't import more than a specified amount of a quantity of some good from a country.